screen cord. Then we can press the live button. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavins Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavins. Here at Cavins HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign that ends next week. You can donate or share by going to our link at https slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Tom Calza. Tom, are you ready to be great today? Absolutely. Tom is a founder and CEO of AWeber, the leading email marketing and automation platform for small business, where he is actively involved in the company's strategic direction, growth, and evolution. Over the company's 20 plus year history, Tom has nurtured AWeber from a small startup to a robust organization that has enabled over 1 million customers to grow the business, all with a public or VC funding. Tom laid the foundation for AWeber while working at a computer hardware firm in the mid 1990s, where he realized sales prospects were falling through the cracks due to the lack of proper, proper follow up. By automating the delivery of personalized follow up emails to prospects, company wide sales skyrocketed, and sales associates had a difficult time to spend pursuing new prospects. Tom, thanks for being here today. First, am I seeing the name of your company correctly? Is it AWeber? AWeber? Yeah. Okay. Yep, okay. You got it. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure you never know how people name companies these days, right? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, born out of automated web assistant. And oh, it kind of nice. got it got shrunk down to AWeber because you can't name your company AWeb ass. That that would be inappropriate. No, <laughs> so it became probably, AWeber. <laughs> that'd be probably bad. Yeah. So first thing, what is small define small business from your definition? I think there's a lot. I think because I think the SBA's definition is a company with 500 or fewer people. <laughs> yes. Small business, right? So what's your definition of small business? Yeah, for us and, and who we typically work with, you know, is it's your small mom and pop kind of business where it's <laughs> they themselves and, and, and they're it. Um, you know, most of our customers tend to be less than 50 employees, 50 to 100 employees at the most. Um, we do work with some larger, but it tends to be more in the realm of like a department within a much larger enterprise, uh, you know, like Comcast or something like that will work with a specific department within, within that business. But for us, you know, small business is typically 50 employees or less. Now, um, does revenue make a difference in defining the small business or is this based on number of people? For us, no, not, not so much. I, I found that revenue doesn't tend to impact how the business necessarily operates more and how the business operates is, is defined by like how many people you have as to whether or not you have defined roles for specific things within the business, or you have somebody like a founder that's doing everything that's like a jack of all trades. Uh, and that like kind of education experience level is different for, for, for businesses and, and people in those roles in those businesses. So you, you've had the company 20 years and never bought an outside funding, which I think is quite impressive. Like how have you pulled this off, right? I, was it a challenge to, to keep it, you know, quote unquote bootstrap and, you know, customer money? Did you get pressure from like VCs? Hey, you have a great company to me invest. How did you work through, how did you work through all that? Yeah, there, there's m multiple layers to that question. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, it starts with, you know, just having, having a business and having a product that solves a problem for end users in a way that they're willing to trade money for those services and those solutions. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of businesses run under kind of the, the eyeball framework of like, hey, I get more eyeballs. I don't necessarily need to have money from, from those users in order to sustain. And the sustainability comes from, you know, VC or PE, you know, private equity funding, um, that, that that's kind of the revenue driver and they build enterprise value just based on having a larger audience. For me, it's always been uh, around delivering a really great product, you know, building a team, a great team around that product to support the product, um, and then having customers that that are supporting you at the at the same time. So it's kind of that virtuous circle of the three things together uh, that that make a company sustainable in the long term. Because a company that is just, you know, funded via private equity or VC funding is only as good as the last check they have. If they can't survive off the revenue that they're driving from their users, when that funding dries up, if they don't have another option, they're out of business and now you've left all those users hanging. So it's about balancing that like growth rate with what you can sustainably um, 
you know, finance internally and so forth. So there's, there's different approaches to, to the business. You know, at the end of the day, I still own 100% of the equity of the business. Um, there's, there's no outside force besides our customers that really drives how we make decisions, which is totally different than a, a funded company because you have equity shareholders that you make decisions differently based on that. Your timelines are entirely different. Like it just, it changes the whole dynamic around how you provide value to your users in the world. So, and, and how you ultimately treat your team as well internally. Tom, do you have any original people from when you were here, like today, 20 years ago? Uh, almost. So my, our COO, our chief operating officer, Sean Cohen has been with us a, almost that long. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I ran everything myself, literally all by myself for the first two years. So, um, you know, and from there it was, was growing. So Sean was in the, in the single digit number of hires uh, from, from when I, I started the company many, many years ago. So, and he's been with us a long time. And we have a number of folks that have been with us for over a decade now, which is really cool. <laughs> and how many people do you have working for you now? Uh, there's close to a hundred. So, so I know yeah. on your LinkedIn profile, you have your company values on there, which I think is great that your values like upfront and like everyone knows who they are. How have you dealt with this? Mm -hmm. like, obviously, like the more people you have, I think it's harder for you to like instill your values in, in more people. It's hard to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. How do you make sure all these new hires that you may or may not meet um, or instill the values of the company? Yeah, I think it's, you know, one, writing them down. <laughs> start, you know, start there. Like we have them on our blog. We have them internally. It's part of, surprisingly, we have an email follow-up process for when somebody starts with the company that helps train them over time and kind of educates them around the core values as well as other systems and processes that we have internally. Like we use our own tools to do those things. Um, but it's really, you know, core values and, and getting everybody kind of up to speed on them is about making sure that everyone along the way understands what they are and why they exist so that it's not just me that's helping to train and teach new folks about those. You know, I, I say that our core values aren't necessarily, they're, they're not like rules and they're not, um, they're, well, there are kind of rules, but like they're guidelines around how team members should operate in my absence or in the absence of any other manager. It's, it's how we go about making decisions. It's kind of like you run the, you run the checklist and it's like, okay, does it meet this one? Does it meet this one? Does it meet this one? Yes. Okay. That's probably a good decision to move forward. And it's like, if, if it doesn't meet some of those, then there's probably some additional conversation that needs to go on around whatever the decision is that that's trying to be moved forward there. So it's, you know, it's how team members operate when, when I'm not present or when others aren't present to, to be able to give input on certain things, which I can't be everywhere. <laughs> so that, that would be insane. You know, Tom, so do you and your team like revisit the core values like once a year, once a month, or are these pretty much been like what they've been since the beginning of the company? Um, they definitely haven't been around forever. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think we wrote them down. I don't know when exactly we wrote them down, but it was definitely not in the first five years. I think we probably at like, you know, maybe seven years in is when we like first wrote down like what our actual core values were. It was kind of like we all, we all kind of had a general idea of what they were um, and how we operated, but it had never really been formally written down. Uh, and we've modified them, I want to say three times since then, like where we've just kind of subtly tweaked them as circumstances have changed and as the world around us has changed, um, you know, we, we've, we've changed them. Um, I can't say that there's like an official monthly or annual review process on them. It's more... Uh, you know, if somebody flags internally like, hey, this isn't quite how we operate anymore. Like the world's changed or the business has changed or our users have changed in some way where we need to adapt. Um, and it just kind of becomes a conversation and, and gets modified from there. Um, you know, could we look at it more often? Sure. But there's a lot of other things to do as well. So, Tom, um, for follow up, what do most people get wrong about follow ups? Because like, cause you'll see like, you know, you hear some people say, Follow up, you know, a hundred times you've had to until you get to know a yes. I've seen schedules say like follow up number one after three days, follow up number two after seven days. You see it's everywhere, right? Sure. So people get wrong at follow. Is it just people just don't follow up in general? That's what they get wrong about it. 
I think a lack of follow up definitely is 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 a problem. I think that um, there there's a fundamental difference between following up in a way that adds value versus a way that's just like buy my stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and there's there there's you know how are you solving a problem that somebody might have um, without necessarily you know, forcing them to buy something right off the bat. I think that there's a, a, a balance in, in how you kind of like weave that, um, that value line there. So, you know, if somebody comes, so like I had a friend recently, uh, well, not super recently now, but like at the beginning of the pandemic, he was in the fire services business where like the, if you have a commercial space and you have the fire extinguishers everywhere, like their, their company comes and services those, make sure they're at the proper pressures and whatnot. And he's like, hey, you know, how do I, like all these companies are shutting down. Like, how do I keep in touch with them via email in a way that keeps what we do top of mind so that they can, you know, so they come back to us later when they do reopen their offices and they need their stuff certified again. Um, and I was like, well, what, what are the problems that people are thinking about right now? And it's like, you know, at that point in time, it was like, okay, I'm shutting down my office. I might not have anybody there for several weeks at a time. It's like, how do you avoid not coming back to like moldy, nasty refrigerators and free, like break room refrigerators and freezers? How do I make sure I don't have pipe burst if I'm in an area of the world that's cold? Because back in March when, uh, you know, when, when that all started going down worldwide. And it's like, you know, thinking about how you can solve problems for people in the space that you're familiar with. So it's kind of within their wheelhouse of, of you know, areas of expertise that they have. Um, and so it was solving that user's problem without directly saying like, hey, buy my, you know, fire extinguisher services for another year. It's like, how do I be a part of solving problems for their, their customers? And it's really about kind of stepping back from what I as a business ultimately want people to do versus like how can i be of value and then that user ultimately saying hey they keep solving my problems like imagine if i paid you know if i bought something from them how much better it would be um so it's 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 kind of running that balance there yeah i think we all been through all this been through this i'm, I'm not i'm, I'm going to oversimplify this like one you get one email from a from a company day one buy my product day two you still haven't bought my product day three <laughs> what are you waiting for this is the best deal ever versus another company sends you day one send you like an email newsletter, day six, send you like a access to a previous webinar they did, you know, so each email like add value, right? So yeah, I definitely think a lot of companies need to do a better job of that. Absolutely. So even even things like, you know, when you buy a car, like what what is the follow-up that you most often get from the dealership? It's, you know, buy the undercoating service and buy the, you know, the extra floor mats and buy the extended insurance versus like, hey, how about you teach me how the heck to use this new car? Like they've all got these fancy infotainment systems now, G, you know, GPS and all that kind of stuff built into them. And like I as an end user might not know how to use it in this. So like, what are the simple tips and tricks that you can teach me as a new, new consumer, like how to consume the product that I already have. And then hey along the way sprinkle in the hey you know the winter season's coming up you know rust causes you know x number of car failures over the years like if you want to extend the life of your, the uh, your vehicle you know get the undercoating whatever you know function for it so it's it's about kind of weaving in the value with also the sale aspect of things of, of driving more revenue so it's it's not just the buy my stuff <laughs> yes so Tom, is there a, like a fine line or a breaking or like a definition between following up and crossing over to spam and what is spam? Well, I, there's, there's multiple definitions of spam, you know, in, in the years ago, spam was uh, emails that you don't have permission to send. So like, I never requested an email from you, so you can't send me email. That would be the traditional definition of spam. These days, uh, you know, it's more about I'm. It's more about emails that I no longer want. So I might have previously asked for an email from you, and received emails happily from you, but then they shifted subject, and I'm no longer interested in that subject, and I consider your email spam. That's I think how most people define spam these days. Um, so first and foremost, it comes down to making sure that you have permission to send emails to people. The, uh, you know, the cold emails that people often talk about sending for prospecting and that sort of stuff, that's spam. <laughs> that's out and out spam. I didn't ask for email from you. 
particularly it's bulk email, like it, it's out and out spam. It should go to the spam folder. I have no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, you know, if I requested an email from you before, let, let's say you run a, a golf range and I requested updates about, um, you know, golfing and events and those sort of things at your, you know, place of business. And all of a sudden you start sending me stuff about, you know, the car wash that you opened down the street. I, as an end user, I'm going to call that spam. And I, as an email marketing provider, I'm going to call your, you know, I'm going to say that your account is spamming because you're now sending emails to people that they didn't request and you don't have permission to send. So it's, you know, making sure that your stuff is relevant to what it is that they originally requested and that it was requested first and foremost. So um, those are, I think, the two biggest kind of uh, important keys when, you, when you're thinking about sending email. So Tom, no, you know, they say, you know, personalize your emails. Like suppose someone has a, has a list of a thousand people on the list. And, and to me, personalizing is more than you know, changing the first name, right? Or changing the tag, first name tag. But then again, is it really realistic for someone like a type one by one, a thousand emails to make it personalized? Is there a way to get around this? Is there a system set up to like personalize it even more? How does like a small business owner like work through this? Sure. Uh, well, I think it, you know, a lot of that comes down to when you're, when you're asking for people to subscribe to, to, to get your information, how can you ask like demographic or other relevant questions about your, you know, about your business and about that person's interests in order to, you know, segment and target uh, the, and personalize the messages that you're sending. So I often use um, a uh, pet shelter. As, as an example, because it's like, you know, I as a user, I might go look at a, a, a pet shelter and like, I might be interested in getting a dog. Well, hey, on the subscribe form for send, send me the new new pets that you get in that I can potentially adopt. And, you know, that that particular facility might have cats and dogs and bunnies and who, who knows what, you know, a bunch of different things. But like, I am really only interested in dogs. So if you get a whole run of cats on one particular week and all you send me week after week is cat emails, I'm gonna look at those as not interesting and I'm probably going to unsubscribe or I might mark them as spam. Whereas if when I sign up for your newsletter to get the new adoption emails, if I can just check a box that says, hey, I'm interested in dogs. Well, now what can you do as a business owner? You can segment your emails and only send me the emails that have things to do with dogs in them. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that like platforms like Aweber allow our end users to do really easily. And we can even do stuff where um, you can conditionally do it. So like I can have a section that's cats and a section that's dogs and a section that's bunnies and I can send it out to all, th all three groups all at the same time. But depending on how I'm tagged as a user, I might only ever see the dog section of that newsletter. Um, whereas you as a business put together one newsletter with these three different sections that are specific to each one of those um, users that get them on the other end. So there's, there's lots of ways to kind of personalize and make those messages dynamic that don't involve a whole lot of work and that are really easy for people to do that add a lot of value at the, at the end of the day. So Tom, let's say I get an email from someone. I'm like, what is this? I have no idea what this is. And I'm marking a spam. Like how big of a deal is it to that community that gets marked spam? Like, does something really happen to it? Is like some agencies in the, in, the, in the sky that keeps track of that stuff and like gives companies grades for spam notifications? Sure, yeah, so in, in, the, in the email industry, kind of behind the scenes, those are called uh, feedback loop emails. Um, so often abbreviated as FBLs. Um, and, and basically, so like, let's use, um, let's use uh, Hotmail, for example. Uh, when somebody hits the this is spam button, you're gonna like I as um, I as the ESP at running a Weber, we receive a copy of that that says this person hit the complaint button. They marked this particular message as spam, um, so we automatically unsubscribe that user. Um, but it also goes into kind of our algor our reputation algorithm that measures kind of the. The, the, basically the reputation of that individual sender. So like, let's say you send out an email to all of your HR customers and one of them hit the spam button in Hotmail. We're, we're gonna get notified about that uh, and we're gonna use that as, as a part of your reputation score. But Hotmail and Microsoft 
also uses that as a score around the reputations of your business and the emails that you send as to whether or not in the future they're going to let your emails go to the inbox or they're going to send more of them to the the spam folder so it you know one individual complaint it's probably not a big deal you know dozens of complaints around a message that you send out to to you know hundreds or even thousands of people that can be a problem because it 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 shows a pattern that people don't want what you have. I think it's important to realize though that it's, you know, your email reputation as a sender is not just based on people clicking the spam button. It's also based on people clicking uh, your emails themselves. So whether or not they receive the email, they open it, do they read it and scroll it? So like when I'm in Gmail or when I'm looking in Yahoo or Hotmail, those providers can see that you're scrolling the email, just like you and I, as a website owner, we can tell when people are scrolling and reading the content that's on our website to, to gauge our user interest. So those mailbox providers are also determining whether or not you're interested in the, the content that you're sending based on that. And then whether or not I click the emails or I click the links that are within those email, or yet again, whether or not I reply to that email, whether I forward that email to somebody else, hey, check this out, this is really interesting. Um, or uh, whether or not I file that email away in my folders, you know, and I save that for later. Those all have an implied uh, importance to them. And so the mailbox providers are able to gauge whether or not your audience is actually interested in uh, what it is that you're sending out so that they can make future decisions on how to say, hey, emails from Jason, they should go to the inbox because his audience really wants what he sends. And overwhelmingly, people have told us that based on how they've interacted with those emails versus, you know, an actual spam message. People delete it. They mark it as spam. They don't read it. You know what I mean? Like they're not forwarding it to other people. They're not filing it away for later. So those, those all have very important signals. So it's, it's not just about that, you know, this is spam button. It's also about those overall interactions. Um, so what happened to this situation? Like, I, I suppose I have, I have a newsletter. Someone signs up for it, right? So I send the newsletter, you know, next week. They read it and mm -hmm. like, man, this is what I thought it was going to be. And they hit spam. Is it not considered okay. spam even though they sign up for the newsletter? And like, how, how would I prove that, no, they actually signed up for the newsletter while they're hitting spam? How does that work? Well, there's, you know, there's, like I mentioned, like, you know, a one-off report where somebody marks something as spam, not probably really not a big deal. Okay. You know, it's kind of like there's, it's, it's like that signal to noise ratio kind of thing. It's, there's always going to be some element of noise and out of a thousand people, you're always going to get a couple of people that are just going to mark it as spam, even if it's not, um, you know, and, and because everybody's spam, definition of spam is different, you know, it might not be interesting to that person. It might not be what they suspected it was. And that for a lot of end consumers, the easiest way for, for them to not get an email anymore is to market as spam. They don't understand necessarily the ramifications of what that does to the sender. Um, but that's also why you make it easy for people to unsubscribe. You don't bury it at the bottom. You don't try to change the font color or make it really, really tiny. Like if somebody wants to unsubscribe from my newsletter, I absolutely want them to unsubscribe because it's absolutely the best thing for the overall health of, of our email, you know, campaigns and the email ecosystem at large. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it one or two. It's more about the, the systematic impact that, you know, dozens or hundreds of people uh, marking them as spam could have. And Tom, all this ties into, I think it was called performance-based email marketing. Um, yeah, yeah, ultimately, you know, your performance-based is, is just about the, you know, looking at the metrics uh, that you have around, around your campaigns, whether, you know, the good open rates and good click-through rates and, you know, your, your overall response rates that you're having. If, if you have a, a low engagement list, like if you're, you know, sending out messages and you're getting less than, you know, five to 10% open rates, like you've really got kind of systematic issues with what it is that you're doing that you should be really looking at and, and evaluating how you could do better and how you could engage more of your audience more regularly or whether or not you even need to prune your list. So like over time, you know, I might come to you for a particular problem and sign up for your newsletter where it's relevant to me at that time. Whereas later, you know, so like using the, the pet adoption and you know, example I had earlier, like once I've adopted my pet, 
I no longer need to get new, you know, I, I no longer need to get emails about dogs anymore. So it's not relevant to me anymore. So I might not market a spam, but I might just delete that email every time I get it without reading or clicking through on anything. So if I, as a user, have not engaged in what it is that you're sending over time, I might not have unsubscribed, but I've essentially unsubscribed. So in order to maintain the overall reputation of your program, it's best to kind of prune those people from your list because they're already gone. And you continuing to send to them over time, you know, if, you know, initially 40% of your list is opening, engaging with your email, and eventually it goes down to 30, and then 20, and then 10, and then five, what is that really telling a mailbox provider? It's saying, hey, this e the, these emails are less and less relevant. So, hey, maybe you should start putting them in the spam folder. And you don't want to do that. You don't want that to happen. So it's best that you maintain that engaged subscriber base and periodically prune people off that haven't engaged in you know six to twelve months, uh, depending on the business. So it, it, you know, every business is a little bit different, but that, that's generally what we tell folks. So, Tom, what advice do you have for us, small business owners who are looking to like automate the email marketing, sales marketing experiences? What they should be, what should they be looking for? Oh, that, well, that's a wide open question. The, um, you know, I, it's honestly kind of hard to answer because it's pretty wide open. The, um, you know, I think starting with, with something, I think a lot of businesses don't do anything because they don't know what to do. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to just start somewhere. You know, when you're, when you're writing a newsletter or you're writing something to keep your, your customers up to date with whatever is going on in your business, oftentimes these same businesses are already posting on Facebook. They're already posting stuff on Twitter. They might have a blog that they're posting content on. It's more often than not, like the same sort of thing that could go in your, in your newsletter is, is what you should be really sending out. And that you're more likely to reach a higher percentage of your audience by, by sending it via email than relying on social media or, um, or a blog and somebody coming back to your site to, to, to get those updates. Um, so start somewhere and then look at it as I'm not sending to 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people. I'm sending to one person. I'm sending to Jason. You know what I mean? Like I'm sending it to you and I need to write it as though I'm writing to one person and not as though I'm writing to many, many people because at the end of the day, when somebody's reading it, <laughs> they're reading it by themselves, <laughs> particularly these days, but like, you know, they're reading it by themselves. They might be, you know, at home, they might be out, they might be riding public transportation or whatever. They might be on their phone. They might be on their computer. They might be lying in bed. They might be on the toilet. Who knows? But like, it's one person. Um, and, and so the more you can write to a specific individual and address their issues, the more likely you are to um, engage and, and really connect with your audience at large um, by, by looking at as writing to one person and solving that one person's problems. Uh, and then it just kind of, it snowballs from there. So it's, it's really just about getting started and, and thinking, thinking small before you really worry about bigger scale issues that you may or may not get to. So. Tom, about a year ago, you made a AWeber a remote first company. Was that based solely on because COVID and the coronavirus? Was it something you're thinking about? Or was that pre, a pre-COVID decision? And can you talk about the process of you know, making that decision to become a, a remote first company? Yeah, it's, um, well, initially, obviously it was due to COVID. So we shut our office down in like mid-March uh, 2020. Uh, I don't remember the exact date specifically. <laughs> March was kind of a blur. Um, and then uh, we operated remotely for, I want to say we made the official decision sometime in May. And I've always been like, we had, we had kind of your prototypical like tech startup type office with the foosball tables and movie rooms. And, you know, we had lunch every day with professional chefs and stuff. Like we had, we had a really, really nice office and everybody was local here in the Philadelphia area of uh, Pennsylvania. And um, when we, you know, when we worked together on a daily basis, I was always really big around having everybody together and not having like, um, you know, kind of a hybrid office 
type setup where some people were in the office and some people were out of the office because we've, we've done that in the past and it just doesn't, it didn't work in the sense that the people that are in the office, you know, they have the water cooler conversation or they have the little meeting in the, in the room, you know, in the meeting room and, and four other people jump in because they happen to see it going on uh, because it's, you know, glass office kind of thing. And, and you could see what's going on really easily and people jump into conversations and then those conversations don't tend to get documented and, and retained in the same way. So anybody that's remote immediately becomes uh, kind of at a disadvantage for communication and they get left out of decisions, they get left out of the, just the general conversation, they don't know what's going on because the people in the office just kind of take for granted that everybody that needed to be in the loop was in the loop because they were all there, even though they might not have been. So I was always really big on making sure that everybody was there and we have flexible work environment, you know, to the, to the, the most that we could, but like it was always actively encouraging everybody to be in the actual office. Um, and the decision to, to kind of stay remote really kind of came around for a multitude of reasons. You know, COVID kind of forced it to some extent, but it also, it forced it in the sense that it put our entire team on an even playing ground in the sense that we were all remote all the time. And it really changed how we needed to interact as, as a team and as a company and uh, how we, how we had meetings, how we made decisions, um, what things were done asynchronously via documentation and just comments on documentation versus uh, a Zoom call or you know going back and forth in chat on, on Slack. Um, so when we all became remote, it changed those interactions and it really showed how, for me anyway, I think the, the kind of the defining point was the fact that we, I felt like we made actually better decisions remotely than we did in person. Certain decisions definitely took longer, but I felt like we got a bigger cross-section of the team to have input on things that they, that they wouldn't have otherwise necessarily had input on because they weren't part of the meetings. Whereas now all the meetings were documented or in many cases, there wasn't even a meeting to begin with. It was just documentation and a big, you know, a hundred, you know, comment threads back and forth. Um, but it was stuff where like our customer service team, our customer solutions team could read those and get the context from that. Our product team could read those and get context from that. Our engineering team that then went to implement the things that our product teams came up with and you know that our customer solutions team came up with, they could read the backstory and really understand the, the customer problems that, that we were having in order to you know work on the actual implementations that we have. So like the communications, completely changed and in, in my opinion for the better. Um, so that was kind of one of the biggest drivers, but it was also, there's an element of being able to hire the best talent that we can. Whereas we were originally kind of locked to the geographic area around Philadelphia that was within commute distance or where we could convince people to relocate, to be with us physically. I now don't need to do that. We're, you know, even, you know, a year into the pandemic, you know, probably, what is that, like nine, 10 months since we made the official decision to stay remote. We're in, I've lost track. I think we're in seven different states. We have team members already. We started in three because Philadelphia is like right on the corner of, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. So we were already in three. Um, but like we have, we have folks up and down the East Coast now. Um, and we've got a few uh, that are that are kind of starting out in the Midwest now. So we're starting into different time zones and whatnot. And it's only a matter of time before we end up with folks in different countries. So um, so it's it's been it's been interesting to, you know, it's not been it's it's not all been smiles and, and happiness along the way. There definitely been it's their fair share of issues, but uh, I think there's things that we can work through. Um, I think more than anything, our our team wants to get together. Like there's there's certain folks that I work with every day that I talk to every day on on calls for one reason or another, and like I, I, you know. I have no context of how tall they are because I've never seen them stand up, <laughs> which is really weird, <laughs> you know? So it, it's, uh, it'll be interesting when we get to meet in person for the first time. 
you know, most of that is is not a function of working remote. That's just a function of COVID because I believe strongly that the in-person, you know, bonding that comes from just being directly in association with somebody, I think is is helpful. So we we do plan to have, you know, kind of company and team retreats, you know, once or twice a year just to get that kind of like togetherness. Uh, stuff and they just create the personal bonds that like those of us that were in the office beforehand like already had a good working relationship with a lot of those folks I know all the personal stuff because I got to eat lunch with them and so forth whereas new folks don't have that through anything other than you know slack conversation emails and and uh, you know the periodic zoom calls and you know the playing among us and you know the, the goofball stuff that we do we we'll get together and you know, we've had comedy nights and uh, um, cooking classes over zoom and a lot of those sort of stuff which is cool you do this as a remote company but like it's been different just because we've been restricted with covid so we're looking forward to hopefully getting back to normal-ish in the hopefully not too distant future cooking class over zoom i bet that was a pretty interesting i would like i would have like to watch that but that was pretty good yeah, we've done a bunch of different stuff. There was one, uh, we've had team members talk about, uh, we had one team member over lunchtime talk about pickling and like making pickles and and like pickling all kinds of other different stuff. And like just, it's kind of a cool way to show off the other team talents. Like we all have, you know, personal passions and pursuits outside of what, uh, the the passion that we have around the things that we're doing at AWeber. Um, but it's, it's just been cool to get to know people in a different way to like kind of get a, a little bit of a peek inside their home and inside their life that you wouldn't otherwise get, you know, just going to an office every day. I think, you know, like what you see behind people is even just kind of telling around how they are as a person and, you know, their eccentric natures and, and so forth. So it's just, I don't know, it's cool. It's different. So Tom, you mentioned Zoom and Slack. Are they any other tools that you could recommend to help run a remote company? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that we, we don't, so we, we use Google Meet internally. So we use uh, uh, that for video conferencing predominantly. I spent a lot of time on Zoom with, with other external partners, but we use Slack internally, Google Meet, um, you know, Google Hangouts kind of stuff. Uh, we're also big uh, fans of the Atlassian stack. So like Confluence and Jira for project management documentation. It's really key to have documentation, consistent documentation and things that, um, other team, everybody in the whole company can update any of our docs at any time. So like if you see something's out of, out of date, <laughs> there always is, you know, update it. Um, you know, it helps pass on that, uh, that learning, those learnings to other people and that knowledge to other people. You know, we, I often talk about, um, you know, some folks think of, like to think of themselves as like the knowledge directory and that that somehow creates it's job security. And like I, as a founder and as a CEO, look at like one person knowing everything about a certain thing and it being completely undocumented. You, you're, you're not an asset. In my book, you're a liability at that point. Uh, and, and somebody that is really good at documenting things and making it so 10 other people can do the same thing that they've been doing before, they're a huge asset. Um, and, and they create a lot of value because they can go in and problem solve in other areas that a lot of people can't or won't. Um, so it's, it's, it's completely, the, you know, my, my, my hat as a founder and, and CEO is like, I have a completely different perspective on that than I think a lot of the world has. Uh, so it's always interesting to be able to, uh, you know, kind of coach people along what I believe is a more healthy uh, approach to uh, creating job security. <laughs> Tom, so two part question. Um, talk about some of the challenges you've had as an entrepreneur through the years and how has being an entrepreneur changed since you started or, or is being an entrepreneur an being an entrepreneur regardless of the year it is? Um, so I'll take your last question first. So, you know, how has it changed? Um, I think as, as an entrepreneur, you know, obviously the, the business world and the problem set that we've solved with email has certainly changed over 20 plus years. Um, so what email was 20 years ago is not at all what it is today. It's very different how to make that successful and what our platform is, is very different than, than it was many years ago. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a leader of a company and as a, a team and, and how we serve our customers, um, I think you go through evolutions over time, like, you know, the skill set that's required to, 
to run a one person company where it was just me is totally different than what it takes to run a 10 person company versus a 30 person company versus a hundred person company. Um, so like how you set the company up and how you set each of the team up to be successful changes over time. And it, I think as an entrepreneur and founder, it really requires you to change and grow and recognize like what you're not good at. <laughs> and there's a whole lot that I'm not good at. Um, and, and hire people that are good at those things so that I can do what I do really well and that frankly, I'm most passionate about. Um, and I can have other people that are really good at the things that I'm not and that they can be really passionate about those. And they can also like hold me accountable to the things that I'm not good at that I still need to do, but like help coach me through making me better. Uh, I'm not perfect by any stretch. Um, so I think that that entrepreneur, I think that's, that's probably been the biggest, you know, kind of the biggest area of growth and the biggest kind of struggle overall is just my own personal development and keeping up with what our team needs and what our customers need from me um, and making sure that I'm able to grow or hire the right team members to, to be able to support us at that point in time. Um, you know, I think what our what your first question was like, what what was the like what are our biggest problems? Yeah, like what are you having? What have you been your challenges as an entrepreneur through the years? Yeah, I think it's um, you know, I'm a, I'm a part of a um, you know kind of business. I don't want to call it a networking group, but it's more of a peer support group, um, and we're in businesses that are. You range the gamut, you know, I tend to, you know, I would describe ours as kind of a technology software company. And, you know, I've got others that are more like human, human resources oriented and, um, you know, manufacturing and, and healthcare and those sort of, so it's, it ranges the gamut. And the, the single biggest problem that we all talk about the most and that we all have in common is people at the end of the day. <laughs> it's like a computer, I can program to operate a certain way and do it over and over and over again in exactly the same way. Whereas people are all completely unique. No matter what somebody went to school for, I could have five different people that went to school for the exact same thing from the exact same school and they're all gonna apply it completely completely differently. <laughs> um, and then they're all going to bring, you know, their own personal backgrounds and situations together in ways that are going to make their decisions completely differently. And that's why, you know, going back to our core values that we talked about, why it's so critical to have a core values to kind of try to like dial everybody in, in, in a way to get them all kind of operating in a similar pattern to, to an extent, but at the same time, taking advantage of that uniqueness, to not just solve the same problem in the same way over and over and over again, because that, um, you know, those uniqueness is really kind of the spice of where you come up with really creative solutions because you do have all of those different perspectives going in to solve problems. So it's, you know, it's really the people dynamic, I think that has been the biggest challenge over the years. Everybody has, you know, their, their own backgrounds, but they also have their own agendas, <laughs> um, you know, and, and where one person sees opportunity, another might not, um, and their agenda might not necessarily line up with the other person's, but like they ultimately need to in order to, to really be successful. So it's, it's being able to coach all those people along kind of the, the same path. I think that, that it is the, the most challenging thing that I've found as a leader, um, in the technology at the end of the day, from a software perspective and like what we core do in our, in our business, that to me feels really easy. It's the people part that is the constant struggle. <laughs> so. what's, that, what's that saying? People, your best resource, except when they're not. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure you've got a whole book full of them. <laughs> yes. so. so Tom, next let's talk about your company. Like, can you talk about how and why you started it? Where is it at right now? And what's your vision for your company moving forward? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you alluded in the, the kind of the initial intro, like I started it initially to solve my own problem, uh, really. And, and it was, I was selling a hardware product and I was doing manual email follow-up when somebody, I'd go to computer shows and those sort of things and was, you know, kind of wrapping this product and, and getting, you know, meeting prospects that weren't convinced to buy right at that time, but I needed to follow up with them and educate them and, you know, kind of 
learn more about them so that I could solve their problems more effectively. And, and I was doing a lot of that manually. And eventually I wrote, uh, I wrote a little program that kind of wrapped a bunch of my like best uh, emails and, and kind of FAQ questions and, and those sort of things that solve the, a lot of people's problems. Like after a while you start to see patterns in the questions that you get. So you can kind of like, you know, you've ever worked with that person that like answered the question like at the exact right time when you've had it. Um, th that was really where I was going with the, the email uh, sequence. And, and I basically wrote our first, you know, email automation process um, back in 97. And, um, you know, the company was really born out of that. And I shared it with a few other people. And then it was just kind of one of those word of mouth because it worked really well. And more and more people wanted in on it. Um, you know, where, where are we going? You know, ultimately kind of what we look at as our company vision is connecting people in remarkable ways. And that is uh, explicitly not done exclusively through email. So we also, you know, we have a landing page product for putting up, um, you know, web pages and websites. Uh, we have customers that run their entire website uh, off of just just our product using using our landing page product. We also do web push notifications that are used by a lot of bloggers and uh, like news websites that want to get, um, you know, notifications to you really really fast. So we have a variety of different products there, and and it's really about creating a community around each of the businesses that we serve so that those, those folks can have the interaction and learn from one another in ways that, that you can't with, with other products and with other businesses. So it's really about creating those connections and those bonds and those experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise had um, if they weren't you know, using one of our products to, to communicate and build that audience. So that's, that's kind of really where we're looking to go as, as an overall vision is, is really trying to bring more and more people together. So Tom, uh, for the tech part of your company, has a tech piece pretty much remained the same through the years that's been rinse and repeat, or have you like had to update the tech piece through the years? Oh, there, there's no part of our software that is in any way original to 90, 1998. Uh, it's, that's both the blessing and the curse of technology is you constantly have to be kind of reinventing the you know what what you've done before. There's new ways to do it. There's more efficient ways to do it. Um, and at the same time, like email has evolved over the years. Like when we first started back in 98, it was, you know, you could, you could enter a subject line and a plain text message, like no fonts, no anything. <laughs> like now it's like, you know, you create images and you relay things out and you can have dynamic content like we were talking about earlier. So that like, I only see the dog emails and you only see the cat content and, you know, so there's tons of different personalization and so forth. There's lots of metrics and, and other data that we collect so that our business users can make the right decisions on who to reach out to, um, you know, what, what content is most appealing to the audience that they're sending to. Um, so it's really, it's changed a lot and continues to change. Like we have a full engineering team, you know, it's, it's, give or take about half of our team member uh, total count. So we're constantly redoing existing things and making them better, more efficient the way that they operate. Um, and also coming up with new new product add-ons and, and new ways to add value to our, our users' um, businesses. So Tom, has, how has it been for you as far as like recruiting developers? Like on one hand, it's been like, you know, you're, you're, you've been around for 20 years, so you can, you can actually pay people a, a, a decent salary Sure. All day and you've been around 20 years, so you know, people might think, well, you're not the exact the most sexiest company to work for as a developer. How has that worked for you? Um, I, I don't know anyone that owns a business anywhere that says hiring good people is easy. <laughs> it's Big never going to be easy. Um, so it's always challenging. And even though we've gone remote, like, you know, even hiring remote all around the country and around the world is still challenging because, um, you know, you, you've now, you know, where where we used to get a hundred resumes for a particular position, we're now getting a thousand resumes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like how, like just the time to sift through those and to be able to give each of those people enough time to, to really vet whether or not they're a quality candidate and whether you take it to a phone conversation and, you know, a tech interview and so forth. So it's like those, those things are all hard to do. Um, 
I don't, I don't foresee that getting any easier as more of the world goes remote, which I fully, you know, think is going to continue to be, I think there's going to be a return to in person because I think a lot of people are really itching for just something different right now. Not necessarily that they want to be back in an office full time. I think a lot of people really enjoy being remote. I think a lot of people are more productive being remote. Um, and I don't think the remote that we've had for the last year is normal by any stretch of the imagination yeah, of what, it's what remote, remote yeah. work. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. People like teaching kids, taking care of people, babysitting. That's not remote work. No. Sense. Yeah. No. Like my kid, both of my kids uh, go to remote school right now. And my wife is, you know, we're lucky in that she doesn't work besides we, we call her the family creative director. Um, because, you know, she runs our family and uh, you know, it's work, you know, with having the kids, but it's like once, once my kids go back to like in-person school, like, I'll be here by myself during the day. <laughs> like, you know, that'll be very different than the remote is right now, where like we have family lunches. <laughs> and and uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate in that like they each have their own room to go work in. Whereas like I know some of our team members like have kids at the same kitchen table they're sitting at doing doing remote work. So it's you know, it's very different right now, but I foresee that it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be an evolution. I think there's gonna be pain before things kind of ultimately kind of settle out into whatever the new normal is that you know everybody talks about uh the new new normal <laughs> but uh you know hiring is always hard i think it's always gonna it's it's never gonna get easy um you know unless you're unless you're paying five to ten times market like it's never gonna be easy to hire and even then even if you were paying way overpaying for for any particular role like it just makes it, it makes that funnel that much bigger and you get that many more candidates and it just makes it that much harder to sift through and figure out who's the best person um because it's not an exact science by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> as you know <laughs> i feel like i'm preaching to the choir here <laughs> and back to remote work i was joking with a friend of mine that I know all the extroverts want to go back to work in person all the introverts want to stay like working remotely yeah. And that, and that's going to create its own, its own set of problems. Cause now you have, now you have that hybrid scenario where people aren't going to be talking to each other and it's going to be, you know, for, to whatever extent people thought they weren't communicating when everyone was remote, it's going to be even worse when you have some people in the office and some people external. And that was really, that was really the biggest decision on, on, I think why, why we ultimately decided to stay remote was, you know, part of it, the technology industry in general is just kind of moving in that direction. I found we were just as productive, if not possibly more productive remote. Um, and, and just, being hybrid is just kind of untenable and like there was no way we we're going to go back to all in person after having been remote like our turnover would be insane um because I, a lot of people really like that particularly our our engineers um and then do you pay for the people out of state you know you know fly them and you know move them to philadelphia and all that kind of stuff that'd be ex expensive yeah so absolutely yeah at this point like we have people you know all all over the place so just getting them all back in one place would be difficult um if not impossible so it's you know it'll be interesting you know like everything you know what what the problems were last year will not be the problems next year and they won't be the year after that it's 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 that constant evolution that's part of what keeps it interesting you know <laughs> yes i um, understand you have something for our listeners today yeah absolutely so we have um uh, complete our product is completely free so if anybody is looking to start you know using email newsletters email automation or even setting up a landing page or frankly even just starting a website um, you know you can use aweber uh, completely free uh, to set up uh, a list to create an email newsletter list up to 500 subscribers uh, we have full customer service uh, available for both our free as well as our paid users uh, and anybody can check it out. If you go to aweber.com, uh, A-W-E-B-E-R.com, uh, you can sign up for a free account today. Uh, and that's for, for life. So there's, it, there's no timeline or deadline on that. So we hope that any, any, everybody check it out. Tom, can you share your social media links for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure. You can find, if you just punch in a Weber and Facebook, uh, you know, or Twitter, we're, we're, we're on all the usual uh, places. If you punch in Tom Colzer and Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, you'll come up with me. Um, but uh, I'm uh, T Colzer on, on Twitter. 
Um, but I, I'm not hard to find. If you go to tomcolzer.com, you can also find all my social links. Uh, or you go to aweber.com, you can find all of our social links as well. So we're not hard to track down and we look forward to chatting with anybody that, you know, we can help. Tom, so do you have a favorite or a go-to social media platform? Do I have a favorite? I love email. <laughs> um, I, you know, I definitely, um, you know, it's more social than most people uh, like to think. Um, and I, I spend most of my time on Twitter. I don't, most of my Facebook, uh, most of my Facebook participation is more personal private stuff. So I keep a lot of that private there, but for, from a business perspective, absolutely hit me up on Twitter. So and to our listeners, we have the link to his gift and social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshrblog.com. And be sure to check out our crowdfunding link and share and donate it at https kevinshr.co slash crowdfunding. Tom, this is a great talk, but unfortunately we're coming to the end of it now. Can you give us any last minute wisdom on our advice or anything you want to talk about? Uh, I would say just get started, do, do something, whatever that thing is that you've had on your to-do list that you've been like anxious about and, and not wanting to get started, just, just like put something out there because once it's out there, it, you kind of get over that inertia, you know, that the inertial, uh, and, and you, you, you'll start the ball rolling. So really whether it's starting a newsletter, starting a business, just do something, get it out in the world so you can start getting feedback and, and the rest will kind of go from there. But until you get started, you're not going to get any results and you're not going to get any feedback. So just move things forward. Tom, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on Jason. It's been fun. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.